Okay, welcome everybody. My name is Jody Fulford. I'm the executive director of the Ashton Jewel Association, and I'm delighted to be your MC tonight. Uh, I would like to thank you all for coming out to our first COVID style event. So please, feedback is welcome at the end. <laughs> Working on it. Um, I honestly wasn't sure how this was going to go today, uh, and we, you know, with the masks and people's comfort zones and everything like that, but um, there's a really good uh, Theodore Roosevelt quote, and it says, do what you can with what you have where you are. So I feel that's something we could really apply to what we're doing right now. Uh, a couple of quick thank yous, we'll get these out of the way, and um, make sure you're connecting with the right people. So I'm going to call all the names, please stand, give a little wave, hold your applause. We have... Representing Lac St. Anne in Parkland County, our MLA Shane Getson. Hi. Representing Drayton Valley in Parkland County, MLA Mark Smith. Uh, we have our president here from the Action Business Association, Roger Ward. I won't ask him to stand. <laughs> we have our VP, Colin Tooth, Jen Cole Construction. Our treasurer, Kathy Dole, Hayworth Equipment. There she is. Our, we have a director, Tyler Real, Falco Plastics. Another director, Cam Milliken of Genex Inc., the back of the room. We have a director, Jim Snowden from Powell Canada Inc., over there. And we have, of course, our sponsor for tonight, Parkland County. Thank you very much for your ongoing support to the growth and development of the business in our community. Um, we have two of the members from the economic development team here today to help us out. Robert Fernandez, the director, and their manager, Rob McMullen. From our co-hosts, the Greater Parkland Regional Chamber of Commerce, we have our president, Richard Wong, and CEO, Sarah Perry. Round of applause for everybody and all their efforts to bring this to <laughs> Next, I'm gonna bring out Colin Tooth. He's our VP of the Ashton Business Association. Colin Tooth has over 35 years in the construction industry in many sectors, such as business development, the glass and window business, the steel industry, and most recently in the past 11 years, as director for general contracting firms. Colin is the director of business development at Gen Call Construction located in Atchison. As many of you may know, Gen Call Construction was formally founded here in Stony Plain some 42 years ago. Colin is highly skilled in negotiation, budgets, value <coughs> engineering sales. He fosters strong business relationships and builds new ones to help promote the local development as a need of achieving economic growth. Colin Tooth is on the Atchison Business Association Board and has been a director since 2018. He now serves as a vice president. He is known for his leadership skills and his drive for excellence helps contribute to our strategic development and growth. Would you please welcome Colin Tooth. Thank you all for being here. This is wonderful. Um, we, we weren't sure what the, what the turnout would be like, uh, but thank you for being here. Uh, the other thing too is the weather. That was kind of a nasty storm out there and just adds to the challenges that uh, us contractors have uh, trying to build in this country, but uh, we, we will make, try and make the best of it. Catch up. So on behalf of the Hutchison Business Association, I'm happy to see your faces in person tonight. And I'm looking forward to hearing Shane's update uh, with potential new infrastructure work and the economic boost it will bring to our area. Uh, as one of the largest and fastest growing industrial areas in Western Canada, the Atchison Industrial Area has 7.9 million square feet of developed space. With proximity to major urban centers and a competitive tax advantage, Atchison is one of the top communities for business in Alberta. Atchison is home to a wide range of businesses, including manufacturing, construction services, engineering services, agri-food, transportation, distribution, logistics, and more. It provides easy access to major transportation corridors, corridors uh, rail lines, and for both domestic and international air shipments. The businesses in Atchison play a vital role in our community by producing jobs 
enriching local culture, providing goods and services, and are a major component to the Alberta economic engine. The, this community's in, uh, commitment to business, innovation, and investment in its region will continue to grow. Atchison has a vibrant business community with an industry-friendly focus that continues to grow with new faces in the park, such as Western Archives and Shredding, Freedom Cannabis, Champion Pet Foods, Steel Equipment, and Fountain Tire, who's actually right across the street from our office, 180,000 square foot building, and it's just opened up, so it's great. Um, and as we see this continued growth, we have expansions of our fellow members, such as SMS Equipment, North American Group, Rack Shack, Martin Equipment, Sky Eye Measurements, Vision RV, Summit Trailer, and Smoke and Ash Canadian Barbecue Restaurant. I apologize if, if I've missed anyone. Uh, and I congratulate all of you on your continued success. The Atchison Business Association fosters an engaged business community in Atchison, in Atchison to build meaningful connections and to be a strong representative and a valuable resource to our members. The, the ABA represents our members locally and provincially on issues that affect day-to-day -day operations, project uncertainty, and red tape. Shane knows what that's all about. Uh, with our strategic plan, we partner with government officials, the County of Parkland, surrounding cities, and local chambers of commerce to be a collective voice on policy proposals that can impact our members. Atchison Business Association is the hub for social, community, and business needs by providing and sourcing vital information, tools, and resources for business. We access and deliver relevant news affecting the industries in our industrial park and host events just like this one that bring members and guests face to face with stakeholders and decision makers. We cultivate a healthy business neighborhood that promotes referrals and business connections and one that communicates and shares with one another. The ABA is the heart of Atchison, strengthening businesses in the community to promote success. The Atchison Business Association would like to acknowledge the leadership of MLAs Getson and Smith. Your tireless work on behalf of this region is to be commended. Projects like the one Shane is about to announce can only be achieved through the incredible teamwork that you both help promote. Thank you both for everything you do. To our members and guests, we are proud to stand and be your voice, and we thank you for your time today. Thank you. serves as president of Nova Hotels. Richard's personal mission is to help people and organizations achieve their greatest potential. Richard began his hotel career with the Sutton Place Hotel brand in Vancouver, Toronto, Chicago, California, and Edmonton. In 2013, Nova Hotels purchased the Chateau Lacombe Hotel and recruited Richard to transition this once iconic hotel back to its former glory. In 2017, Richard was appointed general manager of the Edmonton Convention Center. Under his leadership, the Convention Center was named number one in Canada and top five in North America amongst 5,000 venues by International Association of Venue Management. A veteran with over 35 years in tourism, sorry, in the tourism, hospitality, and convention, Richard is a visionary and transformative leader recognized for his collaborative approach and drive for excellence in business. Please welcome Richard Wong. Thank you, Judy. I think we should have just shortened that uh, introduction. But thank you very much. Emily Hudson, Emily uh, Smith, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for being here today. I was uh, driving here um, in, this, in this liquid sunshine, and um, my wipers were going overboard. And I was thinking, what would I say? And, and, and first off, I, I was reflecting on why this is so important today. For the very first time, uh, we have the Greater Parkland Regional Chamber of Commerce, we have the, the, the Atchison Business Association, we have the county. And from our perspective, it's really about how do we work collaboratively 
with a regional vision, thinking locally and acting globally. So when you think about that, thinking locally and acting global, and I think that's really how we're going to get past this. And I, I'd like to just recognize some of uh, my colleagues here. So uh, Frank, you're uh, a board member. I, I'd like to also recognize Paula Adamitz, who actually is a very important person. She's also the vice chair. She actually does all the work. Um, Sarah and I actually take all the credit, but she chairs our advocacy committee, which is a key pillar of the chamber. And I'd like to also recognize Sarah for, um, for her work as the executive director. So she actually does all the lifting, and I just get to be here. So I really wanted to highlight a few things, if I could. The last six months have been really, really an exciting time for the Chamber of Commerce because there's such opportunity for the region. But what we needed to do is really around focus on who we are, what we do, why we do it, and where we're going. And so I'm going to start from the right to the left. Nothing about the right or the left. <laughs> where are we going? We needed to have a vision, and our vision and our brand promise is to be recognized as the trusted source for business voice for the region. And we play in different circles in how uh, what that vision really looks like. And how do we do it? We really are a values-based organization. And we need to define what those are. Why? To promote business interests of the region as defined by our board and our members. So when we think about that is why do we? And so how do we differentiate ourselves, not only from a region, but also from a provincial, national, and international as we collaborate with the Alberta Chambers of Commerce and at the national level, the Canadian Chamber of Commerce. We need to be aligned, we need to be working together. So what do we do? We advocate, we promote, we operate visitor centers. So three pillars that we, over the last six months, around focusing on what we do, but really around three things, advocacy. And today, we're gonna to talk about some of the things that we're going to be supporting that we do and Paula actually is a champion that leads those through the advocacy at the chamber level, at the Alberta level, and then up into the national level. So thank you, Paula, for that. And then who are we? We're Greater Parkland Regional Chamber of Commerce, representing the business interests of over 1,000 members. in Spruce Grove, Stony Plain, Rural Parkland County, and Wobberman districts. I also want to recognize the leaders, the visionary leaders who came together which is the track task force. These men and women, these leaders had this vision with a lot of you, I am sure, in this room thinking, why do we have these organizations? Why could we not come together as one? That we can be strategy led, we can be membership supported, and we can be values based. And so as an organization, that's really what we're focused on for the last six months, and that's gonna be sustainable as we move into the future. Working with the Alberta Business, uh, sorry, with the Atchison Business Association, our, our friends here at the county, and of course our, our municipal leaders and our provincial leaders. I was just reflecting 15 years that Colin and I go back, and 15 years that Robert and I go back, and I think if you stick around long enough, you get to see the same people. So I'm not sure what that really means. But let me get to uh, some of the key pillars around advocacy, membership, and organization. And I just want to highlight some of the things that Paula is doing on the advocacy side. One is agriculture. Growth in Canada label, marketing Alberta's agri-food industry, renewal, and this is actually led by our chamber in Medicine Hat. We, as a chamber here, are a big supporter of that. It aligns uh, with our support local, locally to uh, certainly support, especially now with COVID. I think if you uh, step over here, you'll see a little, where is it, can I just see it? How many of you have your I Shop Local sticker? Oh good, that means you can get one today. And it's free. It's one of the initiatives that we as a chamber felt and how do we actually support, and we need to support local, think local, and act globally. Number two is we're supporting an economic trade and tourism 
which is a special economic zone. When you think about our customer, locally, a million people, which is in the next jurisdiction, Edmonton, but our market is the world. So when you think about that, is how do we create something that differentiates this region? And our chamber is fully, fully supported and committed to ensuring that we're putting those policies in place, working with government to ensure that it happens. And today, I won't talk too much about it, but we support the infrastructure, preparing Alberta's growth by securing transportation and utility corridors. And I won't get too much into it, but I encourage you to look at our website, look at uh, some of the things that we are focusing on. There's a number of policies that are critical to the success of this region. And I invite you to check with us, talk with us, or look at our website. We'll be happy to connect with you. Thank you very much. Over the course of his 20 plus year career, he has had the opportunity to develop multifaceted government programs, led municipal and provincial economic strategies, facilitate private sector job growth, and assist dozens of companies in their relocation and expansion pursuits. In 2008, Robert joined the public service and worked for eight years in the role of senior advisor, executive director, and acting assistant deputy minister in the departments of Treasury Board and Economic Development and Trade. He was involved in the selection of major provincial infrastructure projects and part of the Northwest Refinery Project team under construction in Redwater, Alberta. He advised five premiers and cabinets leading the Alberta Economic Development Authority. As Director of Economic Development for Parkland County, Robert works to help connect Parkland County resources with companies looking to expand and scale. Please welcome Robert Fernandez. Thank you very much, Shirley. And uh, thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, I think the key there was uh, advice five premiers. Um, I was eight years at the province, four years at IATA, which is economic development, and uh, to be whole, five premiers in four years. Stelmeg, Redford, Hancock, Prentice, uh, three months, not only in our life. Um, some, some of us, we forget how, how quick these things uh, go. So, thank you very much for having me uh, here today. And um, thank you to uh, Emily uh, Smith and uh, Getson, uh, and to all of you for, uh, to come, and, and to anyone out there on uh, the Facebook stream uh, that is uh, tuning in and visiting and, and listening to me. So, um, the uh, uh, AMA, the Chamber, asked me to provide a little bit of an update uh, on what is going on in Parkland from uh, the economic development perspective and from the projects we're doing, and I'm happy to do that uh, today. So, um, the first thing I want to talk about uh, is a, a, a large initiative uh, we have on the way, which is a um, international uh, branding, marketing, investment attraction initiative. It's a one-year project. Uh, it started in January, um, and uh, we had a large uh, selection of, of firms. Uh, over 10 uh, uh, different firms came out. We selected a group out of the US, uh, and uh, working with them throughout this one-year project, this is part of the core diversification uh, funding that was provided to the region to really do uh, some strategic planning and some actions around what are we going to do after coal? Uh, we, we, uh, uh, going out of coal, uh, obviously in the lakes area, is a uh, potential impact of 25% of our bottom line, uh, or top line, I must say, uh, in terms of revenue loss over time. So we need to replace a quarter of our economy across the entire county. And that does not consider COVID or uh, the economic downturn or any of those things. Okay? So let me give you a little bit of an update. 
uh, on uh, what is happening there. So the group have, uh, has started or completed their phase one, uh, which is very comprehensive research uh, on, on the differentiation, competitiveness, your classical uh, strength, uh, weakness, opportunity, threat analysis, what is Parkland County uh, good at, good for, and not good for, in order to properly market us and position us. Phase two uh, out of that was to develop a marketing uh, strategy, really to position the county uh, to investors, uh, to site selectors, to uh, international uh, players. Uh, that has concluded um, just recently uh, this month, and phase three is about to begin, uh, which is the, the execution of that uh, campaign. So um, the, the group is uh, beginning to uh, market the county very actively uh, on all kind of digital media platforms. We are looking at uh, uh, inbound uh, uh, media uh, possibilities uh, from international sites like Electric Magazines, Bloomberg, uh, those kind of people who cover certain sectors uh, of the economy. Um, they, uh, together with, uh, with us, are addressing the following key sectors, key markets. Commercial real estate uh, is definitely a key market and uh, the, uh, um, uh, the targets there are site selectors and brokers, mainly in Alberta, Canada, and the US. Uh, technology and data centers, uh, a, a huge market um, before COVID. Um, when did you guys have a meeting that was live streamed on two devices? Okay, so think about just a couple of megabytes we are burning up here in the parent center in Stony Plain in the middle of nowhere, uh, the demand on data centers is humongous and huge. And Parkland has some um, very, very advantageous uh, locations and possibilities for that because we have very fast uh, internet backbone uh, available uh, in, in, right in Atchison um, and, uh, and the energy goes as well to, to run these centers. So they will be um, targeted uh, very directly to US investors, uh, China and Japan. Transportation, warehousing and logistics, uh, the whole e-commerce, I don't have to tell you, all of you, I, I, I bet 20 bucks right here have bought something online uh, in the last four months when you had never ever thought about that because you thought that's for your grandkids or for, for you know anyone else. Um, all of the, the help with uh, the logistics and fulfillment um, when you click and it then shows up, uh, there's a huge industry and, and a lot of demand on that. So, um, uh, again, US, Canada is uh, targeted there, but also Europe, uh, North America, and Asia in terms of investment. Uh, agriculture, every business, very clear. Uh, pet food, um, you're all very aware, and, and uh, we're very proud of, of, of champion pet food. Uh, we were very close just recently to get an adjacent project with Champion uh, uh, closed um, because as they are growing, and uh, I can tell you that uh, Champion Pet Food is, um, their management team is always split half the middle, but one half is like, we gotta double the plan, and the other half is, yeah, but we gotta get to 100% first. The bottom line is they're doing very well, uh, and uh, so that will create other opportunities for more warehousing, shipping, uh, and, and those kind of things, transportation. So uh, every business is being um, uh, uh, targeted uh, pet food, food processing, cannabis and hemp uh, in markets like China, South Korea, Japan, Mexico, uh, US, UK, uh, and Germany. Um, aside of that, we have six other initiatives or projects underway, which are all tying together into the same theme marketing the county to investors, to developers, to site selectors to develop projects. So I talked about the branding and investment attraction um, uh, project. Uh, another one we're with underway is a tri-region agricultural business study. So with the county of the Duke and Sturgeon County, we have principally Alberta's foremost experts in agriculture, uh, individuals like John Knapp, who used to be a deputy in, in, in that department for, for 30 years, uh, and, and many others, looking at the opportunities that exist in agriculture 
uh, on both sides of the river, the Duke County and uh, obviously uh, Park County, uh, and then all the way into Sturgeon. And a uh, huge movement on uh, pulses, lentils, uh, potatoes, some of you might be in, uh, involved in that business, uh, and uh, huge opportunities there. Uh, directly related to that, we have a uh, technical slash policy study underway that is looking at irrigation. <laughs> so I'm not a farmer, uh, but what I understand is the issue is not the amount of water, but timing of the water. And in order for a one of the successful and large seed potato growers to sign a contract with a big U.S. French fries maker uh, or, or potato family in Idaho. Uh, they need reliability that they know on day seven of the sprouting of the plant or whatever it is, they need that amount of water, come hell or high water. And in order to do that, you need uh, irrigation. And uh, the, the best example of what uh, irrigation and irrigation district can do is in the southern part of the province, uh, Lethbridge, Tabor, and so forth. Uh, you're all familiar with McKean and Cavendish, hundreds of millions of dollars of investment going on there. Uh, just this week, an announcement uh, of uh, one of the greenhouse growers with a salad uh, production signing a 10 year deal for all of the endowment, sorry, all of the Wendy's uh, in Canada to produce uh, salad uh, or lettuce out of there. And uh, so we're studying that uh, right in the southern part of, um, of the county, of those lands. Um, the next one is uh, we're looking at. Uh, other land areas to develop. Um, the southern part of, of Atchison, which uh, is referred to as Tank Area B, which is basically south of Champion, uh, backing onto uh, Enoch First Nation, uh, and, and those lands, what, what could happen there. Uh, we're looking uh, um, at the, uh, the lands uh, next door to here, 779 and Highway 16, the Meridian uh, Business Park. Uh, all you've seen there for the last 20 years is a sign uh, on the highway that says Meridian Business Park. So uh, we're digging a little bit deeper into, you know, what else could we do than just, you know, having a sign on the road. And uh, then again, very connected to agriculture. Lots of focus on agriculture is a, um, a small agriculture holding co-generation uh, study. Um, the, the availability of cheap natural gas as a driver uh, with the ability to connect that into agricultural production uh, is something that we're looking very specifically throughout the entire county. So that goes all the way out uh, into the western ranchlands uh, to, to the border. And the last one is um, specifically on, on business retention and expansion. Uh, we are doing a very targeted work, mostly uh, with the large companies in Atchison, uh, both on their, at the highest decision making level of these companies, um, uh, both with their local headquarters and also with their uh, respective, you know, Vancouver, Toronto headquarters, depending on where these companies are, sometimes US headquarters, uh, in, into possibilities of project expansion or any retention. So um, that's the short update, what's going on. And uh, if there are any questions, I'm happy to, to take those subjects later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, we'll take a little five minute break just to. Nope, sorry, I'm a little ahead here. My page got flipped over. Ready to go, Shane? Set you right up, okay. Our keynote speaker today, Shane Getson, grew up on a small mixed farm in Alberta, was a logger, laborer, and equipment operator. He became a civil engineer technologist and then went to work on major project teams for the next 25 years as project coordinator, construction manager, project manager, general manager, and senior manager. He was used often for strategic planning and project recovery roles managing teams in, the can in Canada and the US. He is a private pilot, firearms enthusiast, husband, and father of four children. Jane was elected MLA for the company constituency of Lac Saint Anne Parkland in April 2009 and serves on several committees. Now hold your applause here, sort of one or two. The Standing Committee of Resource Stewardship, Vice President of the Alberta Heritage Savings Trust Fund, Capital Region Caucus, Northern World Caucus, 
Vice Chair of the SEAL Trades Caucus, SEAL for Job Task Force, Energy Caucus, Affordable Housing Action Group, and Red Tape Reduction Task Force. And as an integral part of the Premier's economic relaunch strategy, Shane will lead a task force to work with industry and other order of government on advancing the goal of national and regional energy and resources corridors. Please welcome our keynote speaker, MLA Shane Getson. So what that translates into is Alberta Farm Kid, who worked his butt off for his dad. By the time he was 16, uh, he asked his old man, hey, I, I, my resume is going to look great if I just work for you for the rest of my life. So I got permission to go and work in Edmonton for a baby crew in summer. Kept getting invited back until finally I realized I didn't want to do construction my whole life to do that. Um, found out that I could go to become a civil engineering technologist at NAIT, and that's when the fun started. So I got picked up by an industrial contractor. I actually went back to work for that baby company. Um, some of the guys I went to college with were working on these really cool projects. One of them was a diamond mine project up in the middle of nowhere. So I went down, uh, had an interview, talked to the general manager, and unbeknownst to the guy that I uh, went to school with, showed up about a month later and kicked his desk up in the middle of the tundra and said, hey, I'm your new uh, you know, power base mom. So there's the type of things that the Alberta advantage has given us for a number of years. So we talked about that, that's strong and free spirit. That's really what we're about. The rest of this stuff, all it means is I've jumped up and threw my hand up because I was too silly to know better. Jumped in and, and did it, and for other people otherwise that were eventually holding us back. Now I think we're talking to obviously had some challenges here in the last bit. This COVID, I mean, uh, there's a gentleman in the front row with Matt back and then days gone by, if you had a mask, I'm going to be reaching for my wallet or something at this point, and now we're all getting used to it. And I'm hoping we don't have to get used to it forever. Two things that really bother me that I've heard catchphrases is punch your back. The last time I heard that, someone was picking my pocket or on my back. So I didn't pull it like that one from the last year to one through. And the other one is the new normal. So let's let's say that this is the normal for now. But let's move forward. And I'd rather be standing shoulder to shoulder with somebody than saying I'm out of that. And uh, I think these business community associations that we have here speak that point. You guys have been working with each other for years, arm in arm, digging in, doing the right things, continue moving them all down the field. And that's really what we want to do. So uh, with that, I want you guys to give yourselves a round of applause. Please. Honestly, that is really, 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 really. Now, uh, Jody, I put her on the spot with us. Um, you were my go-to. So, uh, you know, Jody has been in touch. She was one of those first things, this new guy getting elected in and, and voted in. Um, you're good luck. Like this community association, or the, the business association is absolutely fantastic. So October 16th, she invited me to go speak there. I didn't have any cam notes. I usually have a little, and I, I couldn't. I just wanted to measure the tempo of the room and see what you guys were up to. And I heard some of the speakers talk, and Jody you know, managed to put me in a little bit ahead of the schedule because I was literally running to the ledge. So that was October 16th. The, the neat thing with being a new guy at that point is you don't have much to lose. Like honestly, you get in there, you're the new guy, nobody knows who you are. I wasn't in politics before, so uh, there's that old saying, letter luck. While I was listening to the opposition and the kind of motion in place, and, and Mark and, and Bermuda and Ellie Smith, I can't remember if it was motion 20 or something like that. And it was essentially right around that timeline where we were talking the federal election, and there was a motion put on the floor that essentially said any party that supports breaking up the Confederation in, in the context where I came from was mainline construction, so pipelines and, and transmission lines, etc., would give the veto power to each province, regardless of in the interest of, of the actual country. Now you might have heard of these projects, Keystone XL, I know there's hardly any news on it, the Gateway Project, uh, Energy East, and uh, oh yeah, a little one out there, about TMX. Literally, that rubbed me the wrong way. Coming from that industry, the only reason why I stepped up to get into politics is because everybody kept messing around with our business. Kept messing around with our economy, kept getting in the way of the regulatory, making it slower, and I kept saying it was a slow dance to socialism. Well, I've about had enough of the slow dances. So when I heard that this motion on the floor was not being wholeheartedly and fully supported, you know, those words came back in my head, letter buck. And it was because of hearing you folks speak earlier that day, it could roll right off my tongue and off my lips. Now, I managed to get up there and, and rip it on pretty hard. Uh, it felt really good to talk about what we mean in the Confederation. It felt really good to talk about some of the laughing stock items that were taking place, some of the audacities, and that the enemy was us. The enemy has been identified, and it was us. And the opposition were heckling me like you wouldn't believe. And being the new guy, it's kind of tough if you're talking out there and there's people just ripping and screaming and, and 
know, I have the fortune of sitting like literally the row right beside them on that side because we had, had so many seats in the house. And actually it fed me. It fed me because again, they were throwing in comments and I was just turning and ripping on them. No different than I've had to do and you folks have had to do in your business, but setting the record straight. When you get backed into a corner, and I said it was like poking the bear. We've been poked for how long? Well, you get that one last poke and that's it, old Papa Bear got up and ripped on it. That video literally went viral on Facebook. Over 750,000, 780,000 hits. I've seen that right across our country. It resonated with people. It literally resonated the challenges and things we've had happening over the years. And it also bolstered us together looking at commonality. And I ended up by saying, it's very simple. We're here to do the job of the people that got us here, to stand up for their rights and freedoms, to keep us part of that nation, to protect those fog colors, and to keep us part of this country. I have proudly worked right across Canada, in the US as well, and did a couple stints over in Germany for some software development over there. And I was always very proud to tell my kids when I came back home, we live in the best province, the best country in the world. And honestly, prior to the election, I was having a hard time saying that. But we gotta get our wind back. We got bucked off, we got the wind knocked out of us, and we gotta get back up on that horse and ride. So I'm really excited to talk about you about some of these other things. I'm really excited that I was recognized by my colleagues in there for having the sharpest tongue after that speech. I even got a little award for that, and that for the best debater that year. And uh, to be able to, to step in these key areas they've thrown me in. So there's that old adage, either sink or swim, well, I'm not much for drowning, so let's get on with this. And I'd like to also bring up uh, MLA Mark Smith, because he has actually been a mentor of mine going through this new process. So I'll let you uh, talk a little bit here as well, Mark. I'm looking at them, I don't know 
why have I got this CEO of that one better than the newspapers? Why is he in here talking to me? And without fail, every one of them had this comment. Mark, we can spend our money anywhere in the world. And because of the policies that we see coming down the pipe, both federally and provincially, we're choosing not to spend them in Alberta. Now, if that's not a wake-up call, I don't know what is. And I knew from that, literally a month and a half into my tenure in 2015, that if there was going to be one thing that we were going to have to try to do, it was going to have to be to try to keep our oil and gas industry alive, and it was going to have to be able to start looking at diversification. Now, I don't know if you know my constituency very well, but I, it goes all the way from Enoch River Creek Casino to Atchison, all the way to the Rocky Mountains just above. It ends at the Ochis Reserve. So I have everything in Alberta in my constituency, from urban all the way to trappers out in the bush. What an amazing constituency to have to try to think about and to try to help. So the diversification, well, uh, you know, when I take a look over the last uh, four or five years, um, uh, it started with uh, uh, industrial hemp. And we have put together over this last five years the Alberta Hemp Association that uh, has now uh, morphed into all of the major hemp associations from across the province coming together. And uh, uh, we're hoping that within the next week, we can be able to tell you that we'll have a decorative cater in Green Valley that will be able to go with Biocomposites, which is one of a company that produces a, uh, an industrial hemp uh, fiber matting. And what they're doing right now is beginning to sell incredible amounts of uh, six inch long by three inch wide by three inch high, uh, 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 industrial 100% uh, fiber, uh, industrial hemp fiber uh, growing cubes. And they're selling them like hotcakes into Europe because they're using them in the uh, in the uh, 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 greenhouses, the, the hydroponic greenhouses. They've been using in uh, uh, wool. What do you do with it after it's been, been used for growing your lettuce and your carrot? Well, they, now you can use industrial hemp. You can throw it in the field. Ever, I don't know if you've heard of the uh, Ever uh, company out of Calgary with the deep well geothermal. We're working very hard in this government to start working on uh, deep well geothermal heat uh, and electricity in this province. We're working hard on the regulations, and, uh, and that's going to be a really exciting thing. Uh, I don't know if you stopped uh, to think about it, but you were talking about data centers. Well, what if the data centers absolutely positively have to have 100% of the time, 365 and a quarter days of the year? Energy. Energy and electricity. The most stable form of electricity you're ever going to get is deep well geothermal because the only way it's going to break down is if you have a problem with the, with the heat exchanger or the earth stops turning. Okay? Put it inside the fence or that building, that facility. The energy, although it's three or times, times more expensive than uh, uh, natural gas or coal, you get rid of the distribution and the transportation charges, all of a sudden it becomes a, a going concern. We need to consider that. Um, uh, graphene, I don't know, you know what graphene is? I thought I was telling some people earlier, fascinating stuff. This could be a trillion dollar industry in this province, and I don't think any of you guys know anything about it. The one company in the world, the 102 graphene companies in the world, we have one in Alberta. And it is the only liquid graphene anywhere in the world, and it's going to change the world. Let me just give you one example. They are very, very close to signing off with the NFL, the MLB, and the NHL for a real-time graphene COVID sensor. Real-time, 15 seconds later, you've got a result. You want to move forward in this economy, in the algorithm we face, you're going to have to look at what are your strengths and how can we build on those strengths. And that starts with oil and gas, and moves all the way through the elements of the economy, whether you're talking agriculture or whatever. Uh, here's one for you to put in the back of your mind. Forest, little town, in Duke County, 
Did you know that it is the only grower of rhodiola rosea in the world? Yeah, you didn't know that. Did you know that they're coming from all over the world, from France, from Asia, from China, from all over the world? Because the only place you can get it, it's a northern crop that's grown, it actually will grow in your freezer. It's an Arctic crop. It's only grown in the high elevation areas of Russia and China and Canada. And it's been so over harvested in Russia and China that it's almost extinct. And the only source of it and the only place where it's grown agriculturally in the world is in Alberta. And they're coming from all over the world for Rodeo and Mosea. And it's just stunning. That's why I'm so excited about what Shane's going to show you here in just a second. This tuck, this transportation utilities corridor, I think it's the most important infrastructure project that we will have undergone in Alberta and in Western Canada in the last 150 years. I absolutely believe it. And Shane will explain why. So this stand is going to hang this over to his Ollie and uh, take her away, big guy. So I'm a Luddite when it comes to technology. She literally is showing me how to work a slide projector right now. So for those of you at home, you can have a good laugh. For those of you in the room, yeah, feel free to laugh openly. So those are the type of things we're talking about. And, and literally, a lot of the things that come across our desk is how, how do we get our product to market? So we've been doing all these really great things that one of the other things is we don't pump up our tires enough. Now Mark is that type of guy. So here you got somebody sitting in that house and talking in caucus, representing his constituents as I do, or pumping up your tires. So that's why we want this discussion, this dialogue. We want to think big, we want to dream big, and we want to give you the backbone and the architecture to start doing these things again. So that's what we're talking about. So transport trade and utility corridors. So it's not just pipelines. It's not just that, but you know, maybe if that's the anchor, or maybe it's rail, maybe rail's the anchor first. But it's literally talking about finding these corridors, putting them in the sweet spots across the province, and tying into the rest of the country so we can <clears throat> start working together as a nation again. So BC, well, yeah, that's been a bit of a problem up there. Has anyone heard about BC being a challenge? <laughs> so, you know, part of this is, yeah, we, we need to get access to the coast. And, uh, you know, depending on the flavor of the week, some people are figuring if you become an independent nation, that'll make it easier. Uh, I, I don't know about that. I don't think the UN would throw in blue helmets here and make sure that we could have soldiers' protections built through BC. So, obviously, that's diplomatic that we have to get through. Um, Bill C-48, that was a big killer for us. Obviously, with the tanker ban off the coast, one specific product that had anything to do with bitumen. Uh, smooth sailing until we hit Quebec. Well, they like everything except oil. Everything else we're on board with. Uh, Churchill, well, it's a great place. Six weeks of the year. The rest of it, you need icebreakers. And we were talking about the, the rail that goes up there currently. There's a reason why it was sold for a buck. Again, we talked about that a little bit earlier with some folks. It's not the track itself. It's the actual right-of-way that's important. And the terminals down there have been run down for a number of years. So if you're going to go back to the... Hudson's Bay, you've got to figure out who your market is. Is it East? Is it Europe? Or are we just going to try to sell it to Nova Scotia? Um, one of the advantages is when you start to look logistically at this is, okay, if I was going to Churchill, where would I be being bringing product from? So if I'm going out of the Greater Edmonton area, which just happens to be us, by the way, I'm going to the Greater Edmonton area and i got access to Alaska and I've got Alaskan product coming that way for backhauls, then can I shorten the shipping lines and stop the traffic on the Panama Canal? and then potentially move it that way, and then we can claim some of our northern sovereignty. When you start putting the pieces together, maybe that starts to make sense. So we got uh, main railroads, uh, and you think about this, Trans-Canada, everything built up along the railroads. So Johnny McDonald and company, they, they were nation builders. Here's our chance to be nation builders again. And where I'm starting to, to look at is, obviously it's, it's starting to look northwest is where some of that would take place. We have lots of tuck, so it's not a foreign concept. You basically drop utilities in these ring roads. We've been doing that for years. But as uh, pipeline and everything else, we've been kind of making some de facto corridors, whether the regulators have been steering us there or not. But the issue is, is they treat everyone like a sin singular snowflake. So all these projects have to go through the entire process. And for whatever reason, it's, it's been kind of that Russian roulette thing where you're trying to do a little bit better than the next guy, so your approval will be quicker. And that's where we start getting these problems. Expectations get way too high, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, regulators, oh my gosh, red tape intensive. It used to be three years for get us to get a pipeline project built. It's 10 years just to get through the regulatory and then there's no guarantees. So that's sending a terrible message for investment. 
terrible message. Uh, we sold ourselves short on how much we could grow for the finished products. We've been great at exporting raw commodities and being subject to whatever the exchanges are. So where we got to get to again is that value add chain, whether it's manufacturing, whether it's leading technologies, whether it's aerospace, whether it's the ag side, folks that actually want finished food products. And one of the things that we uh, had seen there, obviously with COVID, was one week, if we didn't keep those truck lines open to the States, one week we starve. We literally cannot get the products that we need anymore. That just-in-time delivery model, the offshoring, any of the, the value add that we had, in, you know, wearing some of these masks here, by offshoring all of that stuff, it was all eroded within the first month and a half of COVID. The savings that we had, it was 6.5 times percent in the market by the time we needed all these masks. So we've eroded that. So onshoring is going to be another thing that we're looking at. Pre-approved logistics area are an issue. Again, it's that project certainty and risk. I can go build any project you want. Give me a wind, wind generation farm, give me solar, I don't care, it'll be good. Uh, Bird SIGs, uh, hot SIGs, steam generation. Give me a nuke. I can put a nuclear facility if I'm not concerned about that. What concerns me is regulatory. Time and time and time again. That's what comes up. We could drop in more refineries, we can do more pet cam, we can do all of that. It's the regulatory process. And unfortunately, we poison the well so bad that unless there's some backing by a government in one way, shape, or form saying, yeah, we, we, we want to baptize this one, we think it's a good one. Industry is really nervous, investment community down south of the border and globally is, is nervous about it. So if we can actually get to a point where we've got these corridors, essentially if you build it, then these corridors are pre-approved. Uh, so what changes? Well, we've got a new government. That kind of helps. We still have um, the departments and every, you know, just think of it, your corporation, you had a hostile takeover. And, uh, you know, as one of the gentlemen pointed out, he was in that environment for a number of years. He had a new group coming in. The pendulum doesn't swift or change that quick. It just can't swing from one side to the next. So it's a bit of a, a march on progress. But there are new marching orders. There is a new mandate. And that's really what the significance there. Uh, believe it or not, at the provincial level, we're solid as a country. Despite what the news tells you, the premiers, unprecedented time in history, are working very strongly together. We actually have the Quebec premier lobbying the prime minister saying, what are you guys doing for Alberta and the oil sector? We got some of the have not product or provinces were saying during our economic crisis out here, saying, hey, we know we've been getting transfer payments from you guys for a number of years. Alberta, if you need it, we'll slide it back to you. Like, this is the support that we have nationally, but you don't hear about that. But those are the things that are taking place. And, you know, despite our jabs back and forth at Quebec, it's frustration, it's the irritant and all that stuff, absolutely. But they're 100% with us, with the exception of the oil side. So we got to get that one worked out. But if we get gas, electricity, everything else going that way and commerce flowing, well, okay, let's accept 90% of the battle rather than dying to the death of the last 10%. Um, so the Premier's agreement by Scott Moe, that was, that was paramount, talking about this trade corridors and, and fair trade amongst provinces. Fair deal panel report, obviously that came up. Tons and tons of consultation went into that. And it wasn't just the town halls, it was those websites, all those ideas, and we had a panel that stewed on it for a while and brought it for us. The economic relaunch. You know, so during the <laughs> during the election phase it was pipelines, jobs, economy. Now it's literally diversification and relaunch. And I think a lot of things that we've seen is relying on each other, pulling together as communities. Pulling together as, as businesses really makes sense for this. And then dreaming big again, looking at what we can do with that strategy. Uh, recognition of uncertainty in the approvals, yeah, that's, that's obviously pushed capital to the south. Uh, tax force, so we're putting a group together to actually go after it. We can't be passive anymore because the rest of the jurisdictions are eating our lunch. And we have to be aggressive and self-promoting. But we don't want to do it to the extent of the detriment of the rest of our jurisdictions that are working with us. So again, it's coming down to who do you trade with, what's the long-term incentives, and are these good trading partners as well. Reduce the risk of the unknown, so that's some of the advantages of these routes. Strategic development, less environmental impact. So if we're looking at caribou assessment, it's a big deal out there. I'm not sure if any of you have done linear projects in the past. Any hands? Was that by accident? or by any, accident. Yeah, has anyone rate or worked on a linear project, specifically with caribou? Okay, it's almost like taking that piece of pie Except instead of chopping the pie into pieces where everyone get a portion of it, as soon as you cut it, you have to bake two new pies. Because as soon as you make that mark on there, you've just now interrupted their habitat. So if we put that in context, as soon as one person puts a power line project out there, you just have that habitat. So if I go and put a pipe point out there, just have that habitat, that's literally what's coming back. So the restrictions that come in place get pretty paramount. But if I'm making one cut and my knife is a little bit thicker, 
So maybe it's a kilometer wide thick knife that I put through an area and I'm dealing with that impact once and I can mitigate the risks and the impacts a lot better. And that's part of the advantage again to put those borders in place. Uh, landowners, municipalities, so you do it once. Like let's go through and then let's paper this out and let's say a full build out is an example. Everybody knows who's along the corridor. You get full collaboration, participation in it and everybody kind of knows the rules. It might cost a little bit more, but at least you have project certainty and that reduces the risk. Again, we as governments and our messaging are the inconsistencies, not the hard work you guys as businessmen have been doing and business women and everyone in the industries. It's us. We're, we're the biggest problem. Rail sightings. Uh, buoyant and foremost, there was some pretty neat stuff. So talking regionally and then, uh, or thinking regionally but thinking globally or looking regionally but thinking globally, this applies to our own backyard. So with these different caucuses that we're a part of, I get invited to all of them. And foremost had a fantastic story out of their read from down south. They are the hub right now for moving windmills in the province. If anyone's going to put up a windmill or any big sidings or logistics, they figured it out because they went and bought a little rail site. They figured out how to tie back the CM. They got the offloading, they got the logistics figured out. They're the de facto place to go to. If you're bringing anything on, on shore, that's a big bulky item that goes through foremost. Oyen was over in China at a, at a food conference. And the Chinese delegation there was telling them that they love our products, they love the raw products, but they would love to see our finished products even better because they're concerned about their own manufacturers in mainland. They don't know if they get melanin in the product or, or anything else, but if it has an Alberta logo on it and a Canadian flag, they have project certainty. So they were so excited about it, they came over and they uh, hung out with the Noyan guys and they drove them around the countryside and they were fantastically excited. Our sources are clean. When they go into a field, there's there's nothing like they have back in some of the other countries. They go look at cattle grazing, and it's not intensive, intensive farming, you know, stuck in a factory, so to speak. So what they were proposing was, well, why don't we invest, we'll put 49%, and you guys get a cooperative or something like that, 51%, get your factory in place, we'll take all the foodstuffs within that area within 100 clicks. If you can package it, get it onto our tables within 14 days, see, can, see container that stuff up and get it to us, we'll buy everything you want. Those are the type of stories that I'm stumbling into. So when we start talking about our area, we're sitting within a trade utility corridor, we're sitting under the NAFTA agreements, we have access to market, we've got all these things, and we've got the know-how and transferable skill sets. Now we just have to look at it strategically again. These are the type of things we're talking economic diversity and growing up the pillars of the industry. These are the things we've got to start thinking about again. Now, the other thing is once you get into those nice big uh, main lines, the ancillaries come for free. So everything that's going to feed this, so if I have rail, pipe, power, you put in your backbone, well then the ribs start to develop, and then it starts to flush out with communities, it starts to flush out with industries. You're literally taking in, putting us in that rural Alberta match. So obviously I've been uh, lining up for this one. Head northwest, the rush is on. Back in the day it was head west, young man, now it's northwest. When you start looking at the resources that we have not tapped into, Literally, tying into Alaska, right off the cuff, gives me three deep sea port accesses. Their volumes are coming down. I've got Niski, Valdez, and uh, Anchorage. I can move both oil tankers and real tankers, not the little skimmers, the 80,000 barrel units that you can get in Tawasin because it's a little shallow port. I can get two million barrel tanker units out of there. And I can bring in sea containers. And just spitballing here, if I had a million barrels moving a day by rail to start off with, a million barrels a day moving up to Anchorage, or in those areas, that would only tie up those ports for three days of the week. The remaining four days, well that's cheddar. I'm moving other products that are getting to market and I've also got backhaul. So simply because of the great circle of where it's, where it's situated and the access to markets to Asia, I can beat you with a two million barrel tanker. You get your little 80, uh, or <laughs> 80,000 barrel unit coming out of Tawasin. I'll take my two million barrel unit and I'll beat you at Asia in four days quicker than you can get there. That's the difference. So those are the type of things we start talking logistics and turnarounds. Um, and literally, I want to eat Seattle and Long Beach and Vancouver's cartage for lunch. I want to look at it on terminals. I want to start getting this going. Um, the Yukon, they've been uh, talking about gateway to resources and what their project is. $3 billion is on the table. Uh, arguably, it's a bunch of our money that went east anyway. Now the federal government's giving it back to them. So you got industry puts up a billion. You've got the uh, Yukon puts up a billion and the feds put up a billion and they're looking at building roads and infrastructure to get all their trapped assets, all the mining and everything else. Well, if we looked at putting a corridor, we'd just slide that baby right over through there. So we would open it up, 
be part of that process and then reap the rewards again as well. So who's looking at it? There's a couple groups. Um, the one that's most financially poised from exploration and talking to them seems to be E2A. And oh, by the way, use taxpayers, you paid for this study. So Energy, a few years back, had about $1.8 million kicking around. They fired up the Van Horn Institute and they actually did all the work. So if you want to look at that online for your information, there's a road. I guess that's why it was stable. They did the analysis for a 25 year operation and it still paid off. And the fact that it was multi commodity. Now, this group A2A goes and picks up that information and says, hey, this is going to make sense. And they started running the numbers. So if Gateway was online, if Excel was online, if Line 3 was online, um, and TMX, this thing is still viable. And I'm going to show you some slides later. So it's not like we have uh, a capacity issue. The only reason why we have a capacity issue is because we can't get the damn products to market. My upstream side, we were already planning on building a bunch because you choked off my pipelines. So it's not like this is by chance. This is a slow dance to socialism. It was the death. It was all those type of things. And I get rather frustrated by that. And I probably shouldn't be speaking that way as a politician. But it wasn't by happenstance. So this is us unraveling and getting things back on track again. So these guys really liked that transportation utility corridor concept. So they became the lock, the first pass of so that big butter going through that pie. Well, then they were totally cool with playing with the other guys along there. And they're totally good with making sure that they have multiple partners. And they're totally good with making sure they're open up the industry. Other companies aren't like that. Some of these guys are pretty short-sighted. These folks are on board with the big plan. So here's kind of the road. Now, me being a former project guy, and I'm hearing this stuff, I did pass the sniff test. I started hammering them pretty hard like I would with you know, on any of my project teams. And they kept coming up in spades and feeding more information. And then I thought it was fairy tales and pixie dust a bit, and then I asked them for the actual TMZ file. So this is me literally having their mapping information on my computer taking a screenshot. So I could literally go in there, I could tweak it, I could look at it and everything else. So these guys are full disclosure, and they're open for information and, and happy. So basically starting up in the Fort McMurray area, we buy a Bridge, Columbia. Worked to the Northwest Territories into the Yukon, and that gives us access. So they're like this far away from the presidential crossing improvement. Um, President Trump has already said they're here. And if you want questions now, I can do that, or we can wait to know. I'm being advised we should hold the microphone and there are all the questions till the end. Um, just because there's one microphone. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, no problem. Uh, so the Alberta segment, that's kind of it. The other tack on that we're looking at literally is to go south. And that would be looking at some inland terminal. Uh, because right now CN ties into this road only on one portion up towards high level. And it's kind of stranded on the other side of, of the river. So if you look at CN's infrastructure, it brings you up towards the uh, airport in, in uh, Fort McMurray. And it's kind of stranded. If we truly wanted a multi-corridor, a multi-commodity railroad, well then you've got to get tied in other than just at high level where you can potentially face congestion and there is always that potential for competing companies. Although they have MOUs signed with both CN and CP, CN and CP also have those same agreements and depending on the day, it's kind of like a shotgun marriage. If something happens in one track, they move everything over, but the original guy gets precedence over your competitor. So we would basically eliminate all new positions. Closer to Asia physically, so if you look down in the lower right-hand side, and the line there, that's the 49th. That's literally Vancouver, and that's literally Seattle, oh, that side. 
go up to Alaska where he's open side of the panhandle, you're that much closer physically. Now these are fun things, and that's, you know, again, talking about the multi-commodities, uh, driving up the GDP. Like, and the exciting part about this is when you look at all the segments of the economy, literally unlocking the petrochem guys and get did a presentation to us, one of their major issues that they're having is logistics. They're trying to decide between Texas, and they're trying to decide between Alberta, Alberta, okay, we've got cheap gas, we have uh, more expensive construction costs, labor force is kind of arguable. Biggest kicker right now, logistics. How do I get my stuff, my plastic pellets, over to Asia so they can sell us iPhones coming back? I think that's literally what they're trying to unravel. Total distance. Well, like Mark said, this is a nation builder. This is not for the faint of heart, but this is for the right reasons. This is something that we can do. And within our wheelhouse, this isn't new technology for us. It's a railroad from Rhino Hub. These electric engines, you start phasing in uh, new, new fuels, for example, you might be able to take some of that new hydrogen product we're going to be cracking off and then putting about 20% of that to your diesel, you bring your consumptions down, there's, there's longevity to this. But the worst thing you want to do is go through the Arctic. So I did a diamond mine project that was my first one with Ledcord up north. The last thing you want to do in that Arctic space is to start trying new technology. Take something that's tried, tested and true, so you can troubleshoot it and then you slowly refine it and enhance it along the way. So here's where we're talking that little corridor bringing back to Edmonton. So it's got, and uh, I think Jody will make these slide decks available for folks so I don't have to go through ad nauseum. So here's the economic contributions, the budget, the infrastructure, unlock the north, untrapped, untapped resources up there. That's literally what we're sitting on. We haven't developed it for a number of years, so we start, start tying it together. Um, market access for oil and gas. Now here's the ironic part. We'll sell our bitumen at a discount because we're selling it to guys who don't want bitumen. But when you sell your bitumen at the actual world rates for the guys that actually want the bitumen, all of a sudden it's a premium product. We just can't get it to them. So we start unlocking that, it brings down the differential, and we're also putting the commodity type, the heaviest of the heavies, on train cars for keeping the lights on the pipes, moving up to the commodity or the market base that actually wants to buy the lights. So there's part of it. And I see a gentleman nodding here, he knows that industry too. Investment. Well, 40 billion growth. Projects about 27, 3 each billion. The Alberta side would be about $5 billion, roughly. Now, the cool thing with this, I'm not going to spend your taxpayer dollars on it. What we want, they, they're looking potentially for some backstopping, so similar to the AIOC we put in place. Maybe some backstopping dollars, maybe show that we can help them out the front end so it is real, and then that's what attracts the business. Trillions of dollars of capital are, are held right now because Canada has the same risk value as Venezuela. Gentlemen, that got your attention. Yeah, so I did, you heard the right. We're held pretty much the same when you go to New York of betting your money as Venezuela because no one can figure out what the heck we're doing because that's the messaging we're giving. So again, coming back to that point of project certainty, if a government's kind of backing it, if it looks like you're building a major infrastructure project, there's money for it. The Infrastructure Bank in Canada is doing it, absolutely. And these guys are willing to segment up the project, put it into four different parts, and start running those processes in parallel so you're not waiting for one or the other. They're willing to take that risk, but for them to take that risk, we have to say, yeah, we're backstopping the project. So that's kind of what we're looking at. Construction phase, well, we're spending cash and putting people to work when this thing is actually uh, during operation. But one of the best things about the railroad is it's a railroad. One of the worst things about the railroad is it's a railroad. Like you literally, these things are intensive. When I put a pipeline in the ground, the biggest mid labor is when I'm dropping it in the ditch. After that, it's pretty much, you know, it's on tap. You're running pumps, you're doing operations maintenance. Railroads, well, that's real. I mean, we know CN and CP all the time, and there's lots of guys forever and ever and ever. But going up north, that's actually one of the benefits. Because when you look at the, the First Nations groups up there in those territories, you're putting people to work forever. And again, if we're looking at corridors, that becomes our backbone. We can strap those other less intensive, labor intensive items, but you always have the, the railroad itself. Yeah, how much can we grow it? This one kind of jumped out at me. If we could get 12% GDP uptick overall, these are the segments of the economy that can grow with it. So again, multi-commodity, not just oil and gas. And again, if you start thinking about some of the ag products, well, it's fire up, let's get things going. Uh, Northwest Territories, it's a big windfall for them as well. Direct jobs, 250. You know, construction jobs, 3,300. Drives up there, Marf as well. Again, untapped resources. Uh, who's ever heard of uh, the, what was that called? I can't see about the Delta Pipeline. Have anyone heard of that? Yeah. We've been trying to build that one since, what, the 50s? 
So the issue with that one is, well, it's gas. There's lots of it. Gas is cheap. And it's 1,700 clicks to get it down to Zama. So the last pass took that. But coincidentally, we're recording this route. If I did it as a lateral, and now just shorten it down to 600 clicks. And President Trump signed off on moving natural gas by rail. So all of a sudden, you start going along with this. The whole Grand Prairie area, instead of sending the condensate back this way or the gas back this way, potentially you're unlocking it to other foreign markets. You run your laterals. Again, coming back to that concept, build the backbone, the bones or the others uh, free. Here's the gateway to resources. So again, this is from the Yukon site. This isn't me scrying on the page. This is them. They're doing it anyway. We just got to put the train tracks close to it. So I won't uh, do this. So caution, MLAs at work. Yeah, we, we actually are working, so I'm not sure how other folks work, but I'm a project guy, and uh, standing up and talking in the house, well, that's that's good for the television. I know it's good for getting the laws passed and everything else. But let me get to work. Let me go build some projects. And if I can help all the hands out there that don't have work right now because we can't keep shooting ourselves in the foot, if I can get people together, like Mark, like Tracy, like Guthrie, there's a bunch of us all in behind the scenes that have longed onto this project all the different regions that it's going to be working in, all from different backgrounds. One of the guys actually, uh, Mohamed Yassin, actually worked on that uh, Alaska Valley pipeline. He's a contracts guy on the last go iteration of it. So that's what we're doing in behind the teams. We're, we're putting a team together. And those are the folks who will be working with me in, in all likelihood on this new uh, committee that I was put on. And then pulling industry folks together, the OK kids. Let's start working together. Let's start driving this. And that's what we're going to do there. Collaboratively with uh, the Yukon Alaska, so we've already had a, and I couldn't believe this, um, you know, lamenting a bit, but Premier Kenny included me, actually asked me to be on a call with him to uh, essentially the Dean of Congress in Alaska. Because the Dean of Congress is reaching out to us, wanting to assure us that Alaska was behind this thing. So he included me on that call. That was the day we were touring uh, our area, we sat in there, and I, I, I couldn't believe it. So it'd be the new guy sitting at that level listening to these type of conversations about building these projects. Minister McIver has kind of swept me up under his wing because it's a transportation project. He's kind of made me point on this, specifically for the Alaska corridor. We uh, literally just yesterday spoke with uh, uh, Shane Thompson. He's the Minister of Transportation up in Northwest Territories. So these are the type of things that we're doing right now. And now we've got access to Yukon as well to start putting our project teams in place of how we're going to work collaboratively to get this thing happen and see how far we can drive it forward. So. The, the federal politics, and that's where everyone gets nervous. All right, are the feds behind us? Feds love railroads for some reason. They can take credit for it, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> so if we can send them our cash, and we can get them behind this. This is a big hearts and minds thing for them. So if you have all the First Nation communities are actually participants, they've not just gone up there and doing some survey work, although they are not just going up there and you know maybe showing up once in a while for the photo ops. No, this is theirs. They're going to be part of it. So A2A right out of the gate said, yeah, we want them to be owners in it. Here's the X number of part of the percentages. Uh, as a businessman, that kind of pains you to sell you know, just about half your company or, or put it up there. But for project certainty, longevity, and for the right things, absolutely. And that's powerful. Or the railway act. Because they're powerful. Um, yeah, Mark had mentioned the railway act. So here's some cool stuff. So when uh, Johnny McDonald was building this railroad, do you think he had problems with tying things together too? So there's some old legislation out there under the Railway Act. It gives um, a lot of, I don't want to say power, but it gives more latitude, I guess, to make things happen in an expeditious manner because that's when it was first put in place, was back, back in the times where they needed to drive these things through. So when we're doing a railroad, essentially it gives us um, a streamlined process that makes more sense. It's the, the least red tapey thing we got out there right now <laughs> to put in context. I can pull that one off the shelf and I can get to work. So it helps expedite the process. The other thing federally is when you have a project that spans uh, provincial jurisdictions, then it becomes a federal project. Uh, we did this in pipeline as well with project certainty. We would carve that project up into different companies within those provinces or states. And when you run your risk register and you look at the, the risks on it and mitigating factors, we would build these things until you got to that golden weld. Like we didn't have a presidential crossing approval on Clifford until just about before we were shooting oil down the line. And then we had these nice photo ops where the guys on both sides were out to do that last time. So these are the things that we in, in Pipeline have done. So when I was talking to them on this, they ran it by their engineering group, who was HDR out of the States there, and they also had the ACOM guys that did the original study on them in the Van Horn. They started looking at the models, and sure enough, yeah, they built a railroad in Quebec. HDR did, but they did the same thing. So this is not an untried process. It's something we can just dust off again. 
getting good people together around the table with good ideas and working together to solve problems. Yeah, sweat equity. That is the best thing that I can give you. The best thing that I can give you is you've got yourself a consultant who used to make his living working for big companies, and Bridge and Trans Canada and all the likes and jumping across and problem solving, working for you, as my wife would put it, a substantially reduced rate <laughs> to go in there, drive a project, get the bureaucrats working for us, and get at that concept. So, sky in the pie here at the end. And I'm not going to go through the slides anymore. There's, I'm talking too much now. I'm off point anyway. But the sky in the pie at the end is literally to take the full build out of the corridor. So if you can stay with me on this. I drive my railroad in. I put a kilometer on either side of it. That becomes my de facto corridor. What I do with those interprovincial groups is I put 48-inch gas lines, 36-inch pipelines. I put in my fiber optics. I put in my road. I put in my power lines on paper. I take it down the hallway as if it's somebody from the outside actually making that application. I say, this is what we want to build. What do we got to do to get it done? You get the pre-approvals on that. It goes into a nice binder and it sits on that shelf and, it, and anyone who comes up will dangle that carrot out of the street and say, hey, you want to build a pipeline? Do you want to go up this way? Take this route, pre-approved, here you go. Or, see you in 10 years and good luck. Because that's how the rest of the process works. That's the challenge and that's the thing that, that I want to do, and we want to do as MLAs, is to fire up the sweat equity of us elected officials and going down the hallway and kicking some guys' desks and ladies' desks too, we won't discriminate there, to make sure that we get this done. So that's the idea. And honestly, when you look at the jurisdictions that are doing that, so the 49th, that's what they've actually done. Pre-approved concept, go make it happen. Sort of the details. You've already got it executed at the highest level, go make it happen. And we're at the question period. So hopefully that didn't bore you too much, and it didn't take too long. I, I apologize for that. I'm getting a little excited about these things. As it is, it's our province. It's going to drive our economy. We're sitting somewhere between you know, economic disaster and hover just above not drowning right now. That's the harsh side of it. But we've been here before. And we start putting these things in place. we got folks like you that are starting to grow up your size in business. We want to give you the hope. When we're spending your tax dollars and we're borrowing cash to do it right now to keep the lights on, we're going to pick where we have to spend it strategically. There's no more smear and dirt and ditches. No more putting up little signs on the side of the road, putting in culvert or two or here or there, or building the token, I don't know, school or whatever. Like, we got to spend in the right place. When we're doing things, we got to spend your money responsibly. And if it's a strategic item that's going to garner us, that rate of return, those return on investments, 12% GDP boost, just running some spitball numbers, tying into what you guys are doing, that's what we're going to get at. So when we're talking economic recovery, economic relaunch, that's what we're up to. There's the translation. So with that, any questions? We can start. <laughs> <laughs> can start it. Yeah. I'll, I'll talk loudly. Um, so today, I was yeah, I'll tell sorry, you. There's one working microphone, so or you can blue. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll run around. There we go. I believe it was uh, today, you know, recently announced $19 billion federally. Um, there must have been previous chat where the government of Alberta must have had some sort of inclination as to where they would like to see money spent. They're not just sitting waiting and then go, okay, what to do with it. We've heard about infrastructure programs, you know, stimulating the economy, but we're still sitting here waiting. I, I work with Alberta Transportation uh, heavily. A lot of the stuff came out was not what was expected or, yeah. or hoped for. It's, you know, a repaving here, uh, a fixing a bridge here. When, when are we actually going to see projects? Um, let's talk about the Highway 60 overpass. When would you like to see that? <laughs> yeah, so the, the comment was, uh, you know, the, the feds released a, a amount of money. Um, obviously, we probably weren't sitting there just waiting for this bag of cash to fall from the sky. Uh, no, there was active negotiations to figure out so we could get a chunk of that and how much. Um, which projects are sitting there, uh, there's nothing really big, substantial. Yeah, you won't see that. So in behind the scenes, we've got all these, uh, I want to call them some of the boutique projects that are sitting out there. Some of the ones that were a hangover from last time, they didn't actually meet a criteria. So what the minister had to do was literally put a parking brake on the last year, and that's why a lot of the guys in the road industry had seen this. A lot of these projects kind of got a parking brake put on. Anything that was advanced enough and actually had some monies that were actually tagged to them from the 
but, but the, blah, 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 from the budget we inherited. So yeah. when you go through estimates and everything else, if they were tagged and they were actually allocated, not just printed in the press saying that there were these massive projects they were doing, because that was fairy tales and pixie dust once you open up the accounts. The ones that were tagged met the criterion of either meeting safety or return on investment for commerce. Those are the ones that made it to the top of the pile. Everything else had to be looked at again and scrubbed. So we literally, um, not we, but the minister's office and a bunch of us MLAs had to go through and earmark ones that made sense. You wouldn't believe the stuff that gets asked of government. Like, I, like this is, you know, for me, well, Mark's laughing because he's been there, but there is stuff that, I don't know, it's like that old adage where you just take it and throw it against the wall, it sticks and it'll go. Like, and that's kind of what was happening. So we literally had to scrape all that stuff off and do it. So you'll see some of the maintenance stuff, the non-sexy stuff, like, you know, crack filling again, fixing potholes, because we've degraded our roads. It's been the average life spent or life right now on, on that top surface you're driving on is 15 years old. And I don't know about the Mona Lisa, but I know that I'm aging 15 years, there's a few more cracks and crevices in my face. So I didn't have to go through all those freeze thaw effects. So we have to fix that. So I'm getting non-stop potholes, potholes, potholes. We try to explain to someone who's not from the paving industry or the road industry of how that happens. And you tell them, well, I'm going back and fixing all the crack filling. It doesn't make sense, but you'll get it. So two stages on that. You're going to look at some of the little roads that'll take place. You'll look at some of the major infrastructure projects and some of which were going to be announced before COVID took place. And then we, because of COVID, and the economy coming down with the uh, Russian roulette happening and the Saudi prince doing whatever they wanted to do. We, we kind of got painted to a corner where we were looking to balance our budget in the third year and things were trending that way. That's our new plans coming out. Here we are. So what you'll see is some strategic announcements coming forward. Uh, there'll be some good news for Atchison, let's put it that way. Well, we're going to be looking at the drilling side. Oh, yeah. Yeah, drilling side of things, yes, yeah, and we'll go back there. I was at a transportation conference when the Northern Gateway pipeline was shut down. And the CM of that conference said they could match the pipeline only 12 trains a day. Yeah, well, I would too if I was on the road. Yeah, and part of that too, I don't think anyone was more surprised than some of the protesters when their actual jaws hit the floor and Inbridge said, yeah, no, we bought Spectre original plane in the South. And then Wynn Morgan has mentioned the same thing when he was talking about uh, you know, the current CEO of why they had to move their operations to Denver. So again, that's us poisoning the well. So if you look at the old adage, green on the train, green the, the two, I mean, that's where we want to get back to. The most efficient way of moving a liquid product is in a pipeline. And when I was doing um, um, a transshipping facility on Denny's Home, Pennsylvania, for Enbridge, we uh, were moving walking like crew. We opened up that field up there. We're moving all the train cars down to Philly to sell them to about four different refineries down there. It was costing us between eight to fifteen dollars a barrel by the time I moved it down there. At that same time, I could move oil three to five dollars per barrel. So again, it depends on the product type and everything else. But this one, if we're moving heavy heavies, we're not cutting it with, with uh, anything else, any condensate or anything, and we're moving heavy heavies. And the shipping time is about three or four days to get it up there, and you're pushing it out at that side, then it makes economical sense. When you start cutting everything and getting it down, selling like bitumen for light sweet guys, when you're paying for the condensate, you go into it and selling it for free. The economics usually don't add up. You know, when I first started, because I, in my first iteration, 2015 to 2019, that's when I first came across a and uh, then it was just a concept. But I thought it was such an interesting concept, and you start all of them in the lines, and, and then it's really come together just before the election, just after the election, and she came, came, came in, and I, when did you first meet them? Well, it was, um, yeah, probably in June of last year, so so I was, I was kind of sitting with the gentleman back, and one of our other fellow colleagues sits here, this train set guy, he wants to come in and talk about bitumen pucks and stuff, are you interested? And I'm like, yeah, I'm busy. And he goes, wow, well, you might want to, you might want to pay attention. Let's come and listen and see what you think. So then it was kind of like this. He went in front of us, started talking about it, and I started peppering him. So no different than I would in a project. And I was asking quantities and shipment ties. How, how wide is your railroad? Where are you going? Where's your roads? Why aren't you swinging in here? Why are you going there? And then who's your engineering company? And all of a sudden they started lighting up and looking at me like I was that guy that was just that board of directors we were supposed to be presenting to. And uh, they were getting all the marks. So literally, they did the economics. They had this group called McKenzie down in New York that I don't know how much they cost to do it, but they're, they're really well reputable for doing this. They started pulling the numbers together, and then I started asking about Project Certainty. So it wasn't until that point they'd been lobbying for a while, so it's kind of that symbiotic thing. 
And uh, they had no luck in the last four years of talking about the project because apparently they weren't asking for them to buy the project. They were just asking for support on it. So yeah, it was symbiotic in that regard, and that's why it was so and, and, and I can remember when, when we started to realize that he was talking about a project that I thought had an awful lot of merit. And his eyes were sparkling, and my eyes started to sparkle. And uh, uh, I can remember we were in a meeting with E2A when, for me, and we never even talked about it that much, but for me, the other foot really dropped when I realized this isn't just about taking product out of Alberta and into Asia. It's a far bigger story when we start talking about the fact that Edmonton is going to become the inland port for North America. We're thinking that we could get somewhere between 30 and 35 percent of the trade out of Vancouver in and out of Edmonton. Now, if that's the truth, and if that is what happens, then Atchison had better get their act together. <laughs> hey! <laughs> better than what you're doing right now. Thank you. Because, because all of a sudden. He said it, not you, right? <laughs> because all of a sudden, what you're doing here isn't going to be nearly a big enough issue. So, here was the neat thing I talked about us sending product that way, coming back, it's actually 10 days quicker. Like, I'm not sure if that would resonate. So you look at the just-in-time uh, just delivery model, if I can shave 10 days off of logistics, I'm not paying the demerge, I'm not paying the sidings, I'm not, like, it adds up really quick. And again, if we're sending product over there and bringing stuff back, and that's where you're not tying up the rubber. Yes, sir. Oh my God. I was curious, uh, one of your comments was that we were bypassing BC. I'm wondering if a port of Prince Rupert would play any role in this. Yeah, so ultimately where I would like to have gone would have been Prince Rupert to that. But here's the funny part. You ever try negotiating with out anybody or with somebody when they have you over a barrel? And that, and that's part of it. So C sixty-eight or whatever that one is that killed the tankers was trimmed up in Vancouver by a back venture that seemed to be popular. That's the problem. So it's interesting that you get interest now from BC that they hear we might be going around. So if I'm building out the, the grand scheme here, and they'll just jump on the overall logistics. If I've got access up to Alaska, now I've got something that's viable. If I tie in the tail end to that, now I get into Churchill. Now I can start polluting product. If I'm 10 days quicker to get to uh, the Midwest and down the eastern seaboard, how much quicker am I if I just hop that train two days over to Churchill? and I'm hitting all the European markets. Mm -hmm. So those are the type of things when you start getting that first lock step, then you start building up your logistics. And this is going to include air traffic as well. So air traffic is gonna come back, you have to get here for about the next year, but we're still 4,000 pilots short. Now you start looking at what Edmonton and the International is doing, they're building other logistics chain and everything else. Let's start tying it together. We have a strategic advantage because how far north we are, usually it's a detriment to us, but we've got an advantage we're not using it, and that's part of tying this infrastructure. So great question, sir. What did they say, Edmonton was? The uh, gateway to the north? Yeah. You know, that's an advantage. And, and, uh, and, you, and you, you guys all know, when you're looking at diversification of business, you take a look at what your advantages are and how can you maximize those advantages. Now, um, it's interesting your comment, though, because uh, if you uh, look up my member statement today, once I get it on the net, I remember statement today was all about the Western Economic Corridor. And uh, there's a move by Brazil County and uh, the Allied County and uh, some of the others uh, along the way wanting to tie everything from uh, uh, Highway 22, Highway 39, up to Highway 16, uh, 621, because it's the wide road corridor, and, uh, and then all the way into Prince Rupert. And that there's another, but again, you know, you can see that these things stack on each other, right? If we start looking at A2A and we start looking at this transportation utilities quarter going from Port McMurray to Anchorage, Alaska, and I think on the map there I saw it goes from high level down to Edmonton, okay? And you're looking uh, east as well into Churchill, and you're bringing it into there. Now all of a sudden you need to have access to, to the west coast, you know, and further down into Prince Rupert. Now, it all ties together, right? And so we, we've got to get transportation utilities corridors or economic corridors going east, west, and north, south. And, and we do that, and then all of a sudden our economy and Albert, you know, this is, I mean, oil and gas are here to stay, and they're here to stay for a long time. But boy, I get excited when 
when I start looking at some of the other opportunities that we have, we've got the entrepreneurs, we've got people with vision, we've got a government here that's just itching to try to find these good opportunities to start making it possible as we move forward. And uh, I just get excited about it. Um, we'll, we'll talk with Dale along about this, like it's terrible, because that's how pumped we are, but um, this is up to you folks. If you want to hit us with other questions other than utility corridors, you got two MLAs here, uh, we kind of call this the bear pit normally, so you guys get to rip and tear, ask us questions. I'm too new to know any better to, to not answer, <laughs> so we'll take advantage of it both before I know any better. I'm going to hold on to COVID, COVID rules. Would it not be more beneficial to include Grand Prairie into this? Yeah, so the cool thing with Grand Prairie is uh, that Grand Prairie is close to this corridor at the same time. So when we look at this, uh, we have to get to bypass PC to get that leverage, to make sure that we're there. The current route is kind of a little spitball on the on the page that's already paid for. Now the part comes in when you actually start ground truthing and looking at that corridor. <coughs> and if we didn't overlay map resources, where we be most advantageous to move this? And then you look at the uptick cost potentially in the cost of construction, which could be then potentially augmented by in resources or anything coming into it. So the interesting thing with Grand Prairie is I can pipeline pretty quick to tie into a corridor. I can put up a compressor station or a nice big LNG plant up there and I can pipe it in pretty quick because it's not that far away. Similar to you know coming back from the Kenzie Valley Delta, once that corridor is there, I can kind of split the difference. So without zigzagging it too much, we kind of build the infrastructure, the backbone, figure out where we want our highways, figure out where we want to build resources, get access to it, and tie into our roads. One of the things about Grand Prairie too is it's the team. We have 1,500 jobs that, that are that yep. are in that bill. Uh, uh, the biofuels that are yeah. creating out there. So, yep. so I mean, yeah, it's it's that transportation route. Once you've got that, then all the primary and secondary industries that go along with it. I mean, it must be the first pass. It's not the last one. Wake up in the middle of the night going. <laughs> <laughs> what an opportunity! Any other questions? Seeing none. Once, twice. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks a bunch, folks. For